Hello everyone and welcome to the Null Channel. Kubernetes 125, it's here. Let's talk about it and what it means to you in a year when your favorite cloud provider decides they can finally get around to supporting it. You thought that was going to be a joke. No, 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 no. It will be a little while, maybe not a year, but don't fear. If you can't wait to test out some of these fantastic features, you can always use Kind or Minikube or any of the other local distributions to test it out right away. They all support 125 right now. So go ahead and start testing out these really cool features right now. Oh yeah, welcome back to me. I know I have taken some time off and the summer has not been great to me and I have been ridiculously busy. Anyhow, I'm back. If you like these videos, make sure to watch it, like it, subscribe, and leave a comment. If nothing else, it will encourage me to make more videos, but it also helps other people on YouTube see them as well. And go ahead and share it on your favorite social media if, if you like them. Let's start with some stats about the release. We have 40 tracked enhancements. Oddly, this is the first time I actually agree on the number of enhancements delivered with the rest of the people giving this stat. Of the 40, we have two deprecations and removals with pod security policies and GlusterFS plugin being removed from the entry provider. Six changes are net new. One is marked as a major change and the rest of the enhancements are things graduating one step up. Just a friendly reminder, from now on, beta means beta as of Kubernetes 124, and it's not enabled by default, so I'll be putting more emphasis on those things going GA from now on. Let's continue these stats with the number of contributors for this release. Actually, let's talk about the average over the last three months. Interesting note here, while the number of contributors across all repos is down just slightly at 2,797 from a year ago at 2,842, from two years ago, it is down from 3,380. But the slow bleed of developers is really not as concerning to me as some other things. It still has a super healthy amount of developers. But from the high in November 2020, where we had 862 companies contributing to Kubernetes in the CNCF landscape, but now we're down to a staggering 400 and 57. So to put this into perspective, they have lost about half of the contributing companies in the past two years. And this is not on just the Kubernetes Kubernetes repo, it's on all of the Kubernetes repos. I would be less worried if it was just the main Kubernetes repo as you should start to see less and less code going into it as it becomes a more mature and more stable project. Not only this, on the Kubernetes Kubernetes repo, we see a similar drop from 306 companies to only 144 with a similar drop in developers. Now, before you start saying, but Merrick, that's still a lot of companies and a lot of developers, and you would be absolutely right. But it's the trend over the last two years that is starting to worry me just a little. Now, I understand that this is standard for mature products, but the first stat is across all of the repos in Kubernetes ecosystem, not just Kubernetes. I have a few ideas why this might be happening, and some of it, I'm sure, is just the maturity of the project. And my hope is that this is all that it is. It's just that the project has lost some of its coolness, and it's actually still quite awesome and should not be a problem at all. Okay, as for the companies contributing to the latest release, the top five are as follows. In the first place, Google, kind of a no-brainer. In second and third place, they were really too close to call one the winner here, is VMware and Red Hat. Solid work, you two. In fourth is Microsoft, and fifth looks to be held by IBM. That being said, the independents looked like they were going to take fifth place this release, but ended up solidly taking sixth place. I know. And I, I know I, I said we would only do the top five companies, but really, really nice job, independent contributors. You guys have done awesome work. To put it in perspective, Google averaged 322 contributions over a seven day period, while IBM in fifth place averaged just 63 contributions over a, the same seven day period. Google's average contributions were about the same as the sum of the second and third place contributions from VMware and Red Hat. Okay. Enough of the stats. Do you like seeing these release stats? Do you want more of them or do you just want to go to the lame and boring release notes only? 
Well, I will make sure I put a timeline in here, so feel free to not skip any of the parts in this video, so you might in fact miss the most important part that I will throw randomly in without a bookmark. That's right, skip at your own risk. I dare you. Let's start off with the Merrick list of most impactful features, because I know that I know what is most impactful for you. Don't question this, I know what's best for everyone, just accept it. Now, this first one is going to be a godsend for any of those who have had the problem. And for the rest of you who might just run a standard service, you probably don't care about this issue. But user namespaces is huge. Now, this if this is confusing, because at first you might be thinking this is a Kubernetes namespace, but that would be wrong. It's user namespace on the Linux kernel. So what does it mean for you though? Well, every once in a while, when you want to run something like a database or some special application, you have to give the container way too many cap capabilities on the host. Sometimes if you want to do something really, really cool, like something with PMIM or GPUs, in the past, this would require for you to give the container root privileges. And, you know, hackers, the ability to control your node through your container if or uh, when they found a vulnerability in your container. This is obviously no good. So with this, you are going to be able to give your container root or other elevated privileges inside of a user namespace. Meaning, guess what? Your node should be a little safer in the face of an attack if it needs those permissions. This is super cool. You should be able to more freely give your containers privilege access or something like that without giving them root on the system as a whole. This is a whole nother level of sandboxing. It's almost like, a sandbox inside of a sandbox. I know that there's a movie been made about this recently. Well, it's pretty cool, but while this is still in early stages, it's something I'm definitely looking forward to, though I'm not recommending you rely on it in production till it goes GA. Another note here, layers of security. I know you're tired of me saying it. It does not mean you just give all your pods elevated permit privileges. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. It, it means you shouldn't. The more layers, the better. This enhancement comes on the heels of Cgroups v2 graduating to stable, letting you fully leverage Cgroups v2. I have an older and out of date video on Cgroups that kind of needs an update. Actually, one of the developers on Cgroups blessed me with a comment on how I could make it better for people. So I do plan on re recording that when I finally get a chance, you know, when life decides to give me a break. To make our lives even better, the ephemeral containers I'm always talking about, making our debugging life better by the minute, has finally graduated to stable. This initially started in Kubernetes 1.16 and something I have always been watching closely. This is the tech that underlines the Kubernetes debug command and lets you add short-lived containers for debugging and profit. Okay. I almost did not put this on the list of my most impactful, but I think there are going to be a few people that really benefit from it. And that's the ability, starting with Kubernetes 125 and in alpha, to have multiple pod ciders. Most of you running in the clouds probably don't understand why this might be a big deal, but in the end, you don't want to over provision the IP addresses available to pods because that artificially constricts the size of your cluster. But then you also have to set an artificial constraint on the cluster side your Kubernetes cluster can grow to, and it all starts to get confusing and a mess, and it's horrible. Anyhow, with this wonderful little add-on, it's going to allow you to add more ciders to your already running cluster, letting you grow it after you created it. It's fantastic. And for those of you running on bare metal, I think that this is going to be a bigger deal than some might let on. And for my last feature in Merrick's most wonderful list of most impactful enhancements coming in Kubernetes 125 is the making of SecComp by default graduating to beta. I have covered this before and personally know one of the people's bringing this work to life. Actually, I believe that this work was started in a hack week that I partook in, and it's been wonderful to see it bloom and grow into the project that it has become. You can learn more about them in my Kubernetes 122 video link at the top of the page in my Kubernetes release notes playlist. Anyhow, this feature brings another layer of security to your Kubernetes cluster, and it's most awesome. Let's move on to the rest of the features getting released. Let's start with some security things because I know it's all your favorite. And remember, I know what's best for you. 
The first one up is forensic container checkpointing. This is going to be in my most impactful list when it graduates to stable. I really need to get my hands on it and test it out a bit. And to be honest, I have yet to do this, but this feature is going to give you the ability to snapshot or checkpoint a container. I think this really has two practical use cases that I see off the top of my head. One for debugging a poorly behaving container, giving you the ability to snapshot it and replay it in different environments for testing and debugging and troubleshooting. And for the other one, in the case of a security incident, it might give you a way to snapshot containers while an incident is happening and dig into what a potential hacker is doing or what they did. Next in the security list is KMSV2. This is going to make managing and using your encryption keys easier, faster, stronger, better. It's really a win, 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 win. So I'm really looking forward to that and the improvements it brings to workflows. The next one in security is just really a reminder. PSPs or pod security policies is finally gone, done and dusted. As much as we're all going to miss it, long live the admission controller. So make sure you know how your distribution is going to deal with it and that you understand how to update it. Okay, so there were a lot of things that were moving to beta or stable or whatnot that I've already covered pretty in depth in other episodes. So I'm going to just quickly hit on some of those really quickly. And if you want to see more on them, go watch my other release notes. Uh, just trying to keep these videos at a manimal, manageable, at a manageable length for both you and me. Jobs got a little update that should make them just a little smarter. In the past, your failed job that is a failing because you screwed something up will retry up to a set number of times. But if failure was on some service that is down or what or misconfigured, and most of the time these retries are going to be worthless. Well, now with the retriable and non-retriable failures for jobs, you can set failures that jobs should not retry on, saving you a bit of money and computation and letting you warn that something is wrong just a bit faster. Remember, the faster that you can fail, the faster that you can fix it. It's really a nice win-win as it saves you money and is gonna let you fail faster. Failing faster is more faster, which is more better, which is good. All right, one of the last interesting things to come up with this release was the CPU manager policy socket alignment settings, which is a complete mouthful to say. This is going to let you more effectively leverage your NUMA cores. And I know there have been a lot of things coming up over the last few releases with this CPU manager, but here is yet another added to all the others to help you better manage those pesky CPU and NUMA buses. Again, this is kind of one of those if you have the problem, it's a huge deal. Otherwise, eh, you don't really care. As stated in the Kubernetes 124 vid release video, new support for cron jobs, time zones graduated to beta in this release, though I still have not been convinced that this is really that useful as I would just use a workflow runner like Argo, but I have been told I am a bit crazy for not seeing it as super useful. So I'm probably just a little bit crazy. What do I know? I'm just a YouTuber. We have previously talked quite a bit about C Groups V2 and it has gone stable. Cool, cool, let's move on. Not much else to say about this. Really C Groups V2 is a huge improvement and I expect to see some new features based off of its support. Moving on, we have pod topology spread. This one was stated as one of the net new uh, though I don't really see it that way. I know some things were added to support this, but it's more of, making it work as it probably should have in the first place. The problem comes down to this. When a new replica set is getting deployed with a rolling update, the distribution is not always the best because it gets a little confused as to what replicas are of the old replica set and what ones are, uh, belong to the new replica set. And it's really just a mess and there was no mechanism in place to handle this. To deal with this, the keys match label keys can be added that lets them distinguish between replica sets. To be honest, I have never seen the topology spread get that bad. So while to me this is appreciated and I'm sure it's a big deal, uh, but I honestly have not seen the, the specific case where it gets really bad. So again, while this is cool one way or another, it's always interesting to see things like this where, you know, it's possible specific scenarios can make the issue better or worse depending on your use case. So just because I myself have never seen the direct or the specific things required to make this a big issue, 
and I have never seen it as a big issue, it doesn't mean that it's not a fundamentally breaking for someone else and their use case or their application. There is the mass mass storage migration to out of tree providers. The out of tree providers are all becoming much more stable and have either gone stable or are in later stages of beta. And so that's really cool to see. I'm not going to list all the providers, just understand that the entry providers are to be used no more. And I mean, I see you over there, stop it. Don't use them anymore. It's really important that you follow the, the new out of tree providers as that's where all the new support is going to be put and all the work is being put. Uh, and this is again, just the stability of Kubernetes coming out. You're moving those projects out of tree. Talking about storage, the CSI ephemeral volumes, persistent volumes and persistent volume claims have really only been used for remote volumes. But work has been done to make local ephemeral storage available via these constructs. And this graduates to stable this release. This is super cool and something I'm gonna have to use a bit more. To be honest, I haven't really been able to use it that much up to this point, but it's on my plan to leverage more in the future. On top of this, CRD expression validation is graduating to beta out of alpha. If you wanna know more about what that is and how it could affect you, watch the Kubernetes 124 release notes. It's pretty cool and you should check it out, especially if you make or maintain a CRD or operator. It's gonna let you do simple validation of your operator's custom resources without the expense and the work of an emission controller. It's gonna be super powerful. Open Telemetry continues to get expanded support with this release as they brought alpha support to Open Telemetry on the Kubelet gRPC calls, making things just a little bit easier to track down. This is especially useful if you run Kubernetes on bare metals or are responsible for running it like your cloud provider. Most of the time your provider your, or your distribution deals with this type of stuff. So the cloud providers are sure to start using this as the other distros like OpenShift and Rancher probably are as well. All right. So those were the main things that I saw. There are others though, so let me know if there's something that you found impactful that I did not cover. I love hearing about what all you are up to and how you utilize Kubernetes and find, uh, and what aspects you find important. It really helps me curate this list as well. Do you want me to make more of these videos? Well, go ahead and make sure to like and subscribe and let me know that you want more of these videos. But most importantly, if you did not like this video and don't really want to know what's coming up in Kubernetes and prefer to be surprised, go ahead, hit that subscribe button, stick around and see what else will surprise you in production. But like, wow, it's great to be back, right? I know my soup, my super, my super was super. Anyhow, this finger, this finger, ugh.